On August 3, 1981, the United States of America awoke to a national disruption in the country's transportation system. At 7 o'clock that morning, more than 11,000 of the government's air traffic controllers went on strike, halting airports across the country. Call your airline, confirm your reservation, and they add it wouldn't hurt to cross your fingers. Doing so directly put them at odds with the new president, who was in no mood to show any weakness in front of the entire nation. They are violating the law. Do you expect to go to jail? Yes. They bring you down and you really feel like they are breaking you, but they're not. The ensuing showdown came to be a symbolic moment in the United States. It has had cascading effects in the decades followed, leading historian Joseph A. McCartan to define the episode as one of the most important events in late 20th century U.S. labor history. Ever since the Wright brothers first set flight in 1903, travel by air became an increasingly used medium of getting around, and the air transportation system struggled to keep up with the larger public demand. A lot of this burden was deeply felt by the nation's air traffic controllers. Oh, you work in one of those airport control towers. Our job is to keep him separated from other aircraft under our control. I hardly have given any thought that there might be somebody on the ground who's looking after me. Being an air traffic controller was often a stressful and lonesome job. Controllers routinely worked six-day weeks with no consistent shifts. They were also working for an agency that was constantly behind the curve. It was understaffed. The towers and facilities were primitive in many cases. If you ever saw the inside of a control center, it's the most complex scene imaginable. These conditions led to multiple disasters, including a mid-air collision in 1956, which led to the Federal Aviation Agency, or the FAA. You mean you're with the Federal Aviation Agency? That's right. Well, you must excuse me for being so stupid. A lot of pressure is placed upon these men. After all, many, many lives are in their hands every single day. I imagine most people are in sympathy with them. You all must feel a tremendous moral responsibility to the people who fly. Hey, that we do. The stress of the work led to a strong sense of solidarity among the controllers, and they decided to organize in efforts for a better life. In 1969, the Professional Air Traffic Controllers Organization, or PATCO, was formed as a United States trade union to represent air traffic controllers around the country. PATCO was a highly skilled labor union. We're not talking steel workers here. We're talking these people who had long experience and terrific expertise. Uh, many of them had served, you know, in previous wars as pilots themselves. The union quickly made a name for itself in the 70s with its aggressive tactics and demonstrations to protest FAA actions they felt were unfair, such as too low of wages, long hours, and not enough controllers to do the job. They were known as a pretty militant union and really one of the more effective. Controllers also found that once they did form an organization, they really needed to engage in protest in order to get action. There were 39 work stoppages that were managed or kind of directed by PATCO. These could have involved slowdowns, sick outs. Rather than saying they were formally going on strike, air traffic controllers would just all agree at a, on a given day to call in sick. The method of calling in sick was to circumvent federal law forbidding government employees from going on strike. You have to understand there's a difference between private labor unions and federal labor unions. With a sick out, you can basically say, well, that they're not really on strike. These methods produce some desired results. It helped the government realize that the air traffic control system was indeed working at capacity, as Congress instituted programs that developed more automation systems and began hiring as well as training air traffic controllers at a higher rate, all in addition to salary raises. Despite these wins, the economic climate minimized their effect. It was a tough time for labor, it was a tough time for management. And I must say to you that the state of the union is not good. Millions of Americans are out of work. Recession and inflation are eroding the money of millions more. The corporate rate of profit was falling. The employers became very more aggressive. PACO felt very undervalued by the FAA in particular. The less serious ways that they try to advocate their displeasure with management or their labor conditions aren't heard. They were aspiring to join the middle class that was burgeoning in the post-war era, and they didn't feel like the salaries that they were getting were commensurate with the importance of their work. 
when it came time for the presidential election of 1980, Patco was frustrated with the relationship with incumbent President Jimmy Carter. Meanwhile, the Republican nominee, Ronald Reagan, was in fact a former union leader himself, and he sought out a political partnership with Patco by writing a letter to them promising good faith cooperation between the administration and the union. This was enough to win Patco leaders over, and they officially endorsed his campaign on October 23rd. However, this proved to be the peak of their alliance, as Reagan defeated Jimmy Carter in a landslide election and the realities of governmental relations set in, with Patco now being led by Robert F. Poli. Poli took control of the union in the spring of 1980, just as Reagan was winning the Republican nomination. And it ended up being that those two personalities led into what became such a momentous conflict just a year later. We'll return after these messages. Welcome to 1981. The song Betty Davis Eyes by Kim Carnes is flooding the radio. The summer's blockbuster is Raiders of the Lost Ark, and the world just swooned at the joyous wedding of the royal couple Charles and Diana. Meanwhile, Washington, D.C. was being transformed by the Reagan Revolution, a conservative movement that valued supply-side economics and traditional family ideals. In this present crisis, government is not the solution to our problem. Government is the problem. With the election of Ronald Reagan, it really marked a new period of politics in American life. Pretty much you can say it's the end of the New Deal era. The whole meaning of conservatism and what it means to be a Republican changes. And so you really begin to push for economic and social change at the same time. This ties directly into how he governs as president. He wants to see laws being followed. When it came to PACO, Reagan's administration initially tried to negotiate with the union before a widespread strike ever became a possibility. He's not immediately strong-arming the union. He's not throwing down the hammer initially. Reagan decided to put in charge of those negotiations, Drew Lewis. Lewis had worked in the railroad industry before the war. And he led negotiations with unions. He directs his negotiators to offer PATCO some of the concessions that they want. So the leaders of the two groups were able to land on a tentative agreement on June 22nd that included a 5% addition to base salaries and a 36-hour work week. However, over the coming days, PATCO's rank-and-file members grew discontented, claiming the final agreement fell far short of PATCO's initial demands, including an even higher pay raise and a 32-hour work week. The union looked at that offer as not nearly enough. That's how air traffic controllers in Chicago reacted when they saw the latest government proposal. Local union members are rejecting the FAA's latest contract offer by an overwhelming margin. The union will start bargaining with the Federal Aviation Administration again. But the government says, no dice, it won't budge an inch. Controllers didn't like to take orders. You had to be forceful, decisive, you had to be opinionated. So if you take 14,000 people like that, it's going to create difficulties for anybody who would lead an organization like that. The leadership thought it was a good deal, but when they brought it to the membership, there was a revolt against the agreement and they voted it down. With this rejection, PACO decided that they needed to prove unity among their members with a strike. If we go back into negotiations and the FA does not budge, I think that we'll have to strike. This was potentially a destructive decision as it put them directly in a line of termination. Striking by federal employees is illegal and always has been. However, PATCO took inspiration from previous public strikes. Millions of public workers engaged in this great wave of strike activity. Teachers, sanitation workers engaged in this strike wave where they rejected this idea that they should not have the basic human right to strike, and they struck anyway. It became a matter of principle for air traffic controllers around the country. They wanted to retire from their jobs safely before stress burnt them out, and they felt they were not given the support that would ever make that possible. By July 31st, it became clear. A strike was inevitable. By this point, the once cooperative nature of the Reagan administration had changed to a more hardline stance. To Reagan, this wasn't a protest. It was a crime. These people had said they weren't going to, and it was bad for the public safety. If they go out, then people might die. The firemen go on strike. You can't have the firemen go on strike. The soldiers go on strike. You can't have soldiers go on strike. Well, the air traffic controllers are the ones who keep the planes in the air flying safely. Uh, a little nervous. A little bit uneasy. Reagan did recognize the difference between people who work for the government and people who work for private employers. 
I respect the right of workers in the private sector to strike. He was actually the first president to lead a industry-wide strike of the Screen Actors Guild. So while he supports the idea of the union and what the unions do for employees, he does not support the actions that are taking that he believes, and rightly so, that are illegal by the unions. You wanted law and order in this town. You've got it. His decision was made. He wasn't going to tolerate an illegal strike by any means, setting up a turning point in U.S. labor history. When the hour that would normally mark the beginning of their shifts came upon them, the Paco strikers instead developed picket lines at airports and air traffic control towers around the country. Workers who were used to being secluded in dark radar centers instead stood drenched in the bright sunlight of national attention, with the president ready to act. This morning at 7 a.m., the union representing those who man America's air traffic control facilities called a strike. This was the culmination of seven months of negotiations between the Federal Aviation Administration and the union. If they do not report for work within 48 hours, they have forfeited their jobs and will be terminated. Norfolk controllers remain resolved not to go back to work. Norfolk PATCO, strike headquarters. With the ultimatum presented, PATCO members dug in their solidarity and hedged its bets on the airline industry not being able to withstand their holdout within the designated 48 hours before their firing, with only 13% of the strikers returning to work within the president's deadline. Some union leaders were even jailed for defying a federal court injunction ordering them back to work. The only thing that I can tell you is that I am extremely proud of my husband, what he has stood up for, and for every member of PATCO and every striking controller in this country. President Reagan, the ball is in your court. We're hanging tough, and I can tell you this morning, we'll stand here for as long as it takes. What's the president going to do when we all get fired? What's the United States government going to do when 13,000 air traffic controllers are out of work? Groups of workers who are more skilled fall into a bit of a trap because they believe that they're irreplaceable. They really can bring the employer to their knees. This belief permeated throughout the strikers and helped keep their solidarity intact, as they had a lot to lose. There was only one employer in the United States for the skills of the air traffic controller, and that was the Federal Aviation Administration. So when they were banned from working for that employer, that meant that a lifetime of training went out the window. They were not only giving up their jobs, but their careers and likely their livelihoods, proving how confident they were of the principles they felt they were standing up for. With their declaration to fire the strikers within 48 hours announced, the White House and the FAA had to pivot their focus to make sure the air transportation system kept afloat. They quickly learned that the strike was more widespread than they anticipated, as the president's advisors initially predicted 50 to 80 percent of strikers would relent after the president's threat. They ended up cutting flights in half and called in supervisors to control the air traffic in the towers, some for the first time in years. All the people in the tower are qualified, certified, and they are phys physically qualified. PACO members call the move a dangerous one. When I work 40 hours a week, I'm damn tired. I don't know how the hell they're going to work 52, 62, or 72. PATCO members were emphatic that this was a threat to public safety. If we're off the job, the skies are not safe, pure and simple. Meanwhile, leaders in the country's most prominent unions, most notably the International Association of Machinists, whose members maintained aircraft, hesitated in their conviction to fully support the strike. While they agreed that PATCO members had the right to strike, they were deeply concerned about their chances of success going up against such a popular president. When this PATCO strike is going on, he's only been in office for a couple of months. And most presidents do enjoy this honeymoon period where they have great cooperation between the branches of government and they work well with Congress. He had been nearly assassinated. So here's a guy who has taken a bullet quite literally for his country. Usually the honeymoon lasts and then presidents weaken. Reagan, if anything, was stronger. They decided not to join them in the picket line. Their abstention in turn provided no incentive for any other prominent unions around the country to support the strike with anything beyond lip service. That really cut them off from a lot of potential support that they could have had from other airline unions. We could have shut down the entire airline industry if the airline had struck. And I think if we had had an aggressive response like that, our history over the last 30, 40 years could look a lot different. The strikers around the country expressed symbolic solidarity, but internal apprehension was developing as no news of negotiations appeared. 
Even Mike Rock, a PATCO leader known to be rather militant in previous worker holdouts, lamented the dynamic the strike had taken. By the morning of August 5th, Reagan showed no signs of faltering. The calls and telegrams the White House was getting were favorable of the president's actions by a 10 to 1 margin. With public support on his side, there was no reason for the president to cave in now. Later that day, he fulfilled his ultimatum and fired 11,345 PATCO strikers, as well as banning them from federal employment for the rest of their lives. Reagan was not only judging their actions as illegal, but their character as unfit for government employment. Reagan was sending a message about his own toughness, and especially sending one to potential adversaries in the Soviet Union to say, in effect, don't mess with me. Over the next few months, PATCO never regained their leverage to negotiate with the government. With public opinion increasingly against the air traffic controllers, combined with the Reagan administration's hard line, families like Chris and Gary Lohr say they will continue to meet here at PACO headquarters and elsewhere to show support for one another during the strike. I stopped reading the newspapers because they bring you down and put you in such a bad mood and depressed. You really feel like they are breaking you, but they're not. I guess the thing that bothers me most is that people think that we're out for a lot of money, which just simply isn't the case. Eight out of every ten air traffic controllers in this country have said we're not going to go back to work. And there has to be a reason for that because we're reasonable people just like everybody else. And I would, I would hope that the president would realize that, but I don't think he has. They never got the recognition for that that they felt they deserved. Everybody saw the pilot when they got on off a plane. But who saw the controller? Who knew how important they were? As they were now officially terminated from their jobs, the fired controller's only hope of returning was if the air transportation system would buckle. While the airline industry suffered major setbacks and difficulties, the combination of financial incentives and modern automation techniques kept it afloat. Federal Job Information Center here in downtown was flooded with applicants who want to be air traffic controllers. When I heard they were on strike, I thought, well, it's an opportunity. The government was prepared to handle this situation, and they knew from everything that PATCO had done in the past that they could expect a bigger action such as the strike. The system maintained they didn't get this horrific stoppage in flight traffic. In the end, Reagan made the system work. The union was broken. On October 22nd, PATCO was decertified as the official representation of air traffic controllers. The financial and emotional toll this inflicted upon the strikers and their families was apparent. One of the controllers' experiences was shared years later by author Gregory Pardlow, whose father was among the people fired. My father was an air traffic controller in 1981. It was my dad against Ronald Reagan. It was a big blow to my dad, obviously, in terms of his personality and character. He thought of himself as an air traffic controller. That was his identity. While responsible for their termination, President Reagan expressed his sympathy for the strikers on a personal level. He sympathized with them individually. He wrote a letter to the mother of one of the strikers who had been fired. Still, he held strong in the illegality of their actions as justification for their firing. Whereas labor organizers then and now have argued that striking is a natural human right for workers, no matter their sector. While President Clinton eventually lifted the federal ban on the PATCO strikers in 1993, Reagan's termination and replacement approach, as opposed to further negotiating with the strikers, set a historic precedent for employers. This was a, a major event. I mean, this is an event where Ronald Reagan and the federal government were drawing a line in the sand with the labor movement. And that turn this labor conflict into something different from any other labor conflict that had preceded it. They were replaced en masse, all of them. But this also indicates to private business that this is a tactic that works and that it's something that they can use as well. It gave employers an incredible sense of power and control. But definitely had, as Reagan would probably like to hear, trickle-down effects. We haven't seen any type of labor dispute on that level since. Public employee strikes plummeted. Private sector unions faced a horrible period of union busting. Many, many employers decided to get tough with unions and break union strikes using strike breakers themselves. They were basically following on Reagan's coattails. It was, I would say, the single most important event that precipitated the loss of worker power. In that sense, it was really significant. 
While the bust of PATCO was undoubtedly a symbolic moment for labor relations in the United States, the concrete long-term effects are debated. I think if you ask a lot of trade unionists what marked the sort of decline of the labor movement, they'll point to the PATCO strike. I think the reality is a little bit more complex. I think as much as anything else, it was the automation of jobs that has weakened organized labor. I don't know that Reagan was thinking of the long-term consequences of this. All of these factors put employees across the country in a vulnerable position that worked as a severe disadvantage to their leverage in future negotiations with employers. Reagan's response coincided with the perfect storm of a changing economy, cementing it as a symbol of the labor movement's downturn. However, in recent years, there are signs that collective worker action is going through a revival. A compelling example of this happened in January of 2019. Over 30 years after Reagan's crush of PATCO, the successors of these air traffic controllers gained a huge victory with a very similar strategy. At the time, the federal government was in the midst of the longest partial government shutdown in history after failing to come to an agreement to fund President Donald Trump's desired border wall. It was a prolonged political crisis where he was digging in his heels. We had, you know, millions of federal workers going without paychecks. It all comes to a head when about 10 air traffic controllers at LaGuardia end up all calling in sick on the same day. The headlines screamed immediately across the country that the airline transportation system was shutting down. Within hours, President Trump caved. I am very proud to announce today that we have reached a deal to end the shutdown and reopen the federal government. The nation breathed a sigh of relief as our government was able to open up again, with these air traffic controllers given a lot of the credit. What happened today that led to this agreement? Of course we know there were those major airport delays throughout the day because there weren't enough airport traffic controllers. This event is indicative of the recent uptick in labor action happening across the nation. So we are seeing much more of a push in recent years for support for workers' rights. Some people thought in 1932 and in the depth of the Depression that the union movement was on the verge of extinction. In fact, the reverse happened. By the end of the 30s, the union movement was revived. It didn't do that without being caught in a crisis. And so the union movement is at a similar crossroad today, you might say. The pandemic really brought to light this idea that workers' rights are human rights and that we need to protect these workers because they are really what keeps the fundamentals of our society and really our economy going. Today, I think we're seeing more and more evidence that people are willing to take risks to improve what they see as a situation that's fast deteriorating. I think it demonstrates the power of workers at the point of production because at the end of the day, the strongest power that workers have is to use solidarity to band together with other workers to, to fight for a better world. We have stood up for what we believe in, and I realize that's a hell of a price to have to pay, but at least I'll be able to live with myself, and I know my friends, my family, my co-workers will be able to very comfortably live with themselves. Perhaps in poverty, but they'll certainly be able to live with themselves.